welcome to Baidu's IAS and welcome to our weekly survey of international events. This is a review which we especially curate for you, the aspirants of civil service examinations, and focus on these areas which are of interest to India's foreign policy, changing global equations, power equations, and how they may impact on lives of other countries in our neighborhood as well. Ever since America's humiliating retreat after a defeat, there is no other word for that. Uh, after a defeat in a 20 long year military intervention in that landlocked country one question that has been uh, worrying analysts of international relations is what part of the world what country can now develop as a next afghanistan the metaphor of next afghanistan means a country which is on the verge of anarchy bankruptcy failure civil war ethnic strife, all put together in one. So you could call it a failed state, you could call it a threat to the rest of the international system because it may become a sanctuary for terrorists and so on. And there, are, there is no uh, paucity of such flashpoints all over the world. But recent events have forced us to focus on the northwestern tip of the African continent. What happened was something very small in scale, something not very really disturbing, but it becomes pretty dangerous if you put it in the historical context. Uh, there was a French convoy traveling from uh, Senegal through Burkina Faso to Niger to Mali to deliver some assistance to Chad. Now, Chad is a country with which France has had close relationship. Both Mali, Chad, Niger, uh, and these uh, Southern Sudan, Central Af uh, African Republic, are areas which are landlocked countries. So there is, there is a strategic difficulty in carrying on um, missions, either for humanitarian relief or to support uh, logistically the troops uh, involved there. So Chad has been fighting with insurgents and Islamic terrorists for quite some time. France has been, as an ex-colonial power, a presence there for past seven, eight years. It had a very happy relationship with the President Dibi, who was killed fighting the insurgents. He was an ex-army officer himself. He has been succeeded by his son, who himself is an army officer, but who has brought about certain constitutional changes, which render him unpopular because he has almost perpetuated dynastic rule through these constitutional coups to conducted in quick succession. This, however, has not changed the country's relationship with France. So, France has a presence of almost 5,000 troops in this region. This is in addition to 15,000 troops for maintaining peace deployed there by the United Nations. It's a multinational uh, for, force of uh, troops. Then there are, there are also rumors that now there are about 1,000 Russian mercenaries of uh, the Wagner contractual uh, company, which supplies uh, mercenaries to fight other people's wars in different theaters. It first came into limelight uh, in Ukraine and then in Crimea, then subsequently in Syria. It has been active in Libya. We'll talk about them a little later. But the flashpoint of the crisis is that there is a reasonable number of uh, professionally trained, competent soldiers here. Why can't they then control insurgency or terrorism? So what happened this time was the French, French convoy was passing with logistical support material for the troops in charge. It was uh, resisted by violent protests. Uh, some people mounted an uh, armed attack on it when it was passing through Mali. And before that also, in Niger, it had faced trouble. So it, it was delayed. Uh, the French were forced to uh, open firing. And in the shooting, three to five people were killed. So the scale of casualties is small. But it makes France even more unpopular in the region as an ex-colonial power trying to interfere in the affairs of this region, which is now theoretically completely independent. Now, the trouble has another dimension to it. The French president recently made a statement that he was tired of French involvement in this military intervention and involvement to maintain peace, to fight insurgents in this region, and he was thinking of withdrawing the troops. 
This immediately led to an angry protest from uh, the, government, the, the Prime Minister of Mali, who said that, look, the fr France cannot afford to leave us uh, midstream like this when the crucial uh, phase of the fighting is on. And if the, if the French let us down, we will have no option but to look for aid from other friendly time-tested allies. And he mentioned specifically the Russians in this, in this instance. The Russian troops are not directly involved, but as we mentioned, there is a presence of Russian mercenaries and it is difficult to imagine that Russian mercenaries, any Russian mercenaries provided by a private contractor can operate without the go-ahead given by Putin in Russia. So there is this worry in French mind that if they withdraw, and they are, they are going to withdraw because they think they don't, they don't have such vital interest to incur the losses of life and budgetary expenditure in this region where none of their vital interests are involved except showing the world that they, as an ex-colonial power, this is their sphere of influence and they can guard against possible threats not only to themselves but also to their European uh, partners in the EU. Uh, interestingly, what we have to see that this is a year of next year, very soon, will be the presidential election in France. And Macron cannot uh, appear to be a very weak candidate. He has to show that he is powerful. He can cope with crisis. And in this context, he has made certain, uh, shall we say, rash statements, criticizing the government of Mali by saying that the statements of the Malian president, the prime minister, their foreign minister are unacceptable. They are shameful. Uh, and they would be not accepted, etc. Now, as far as the Malis, uh, Malians are concerned, they have an argument which is unimpeachable. They say we are a sovereign state. It is for us to decide what our internal policies are, whom we get the aid from. And the French cannot decide whether we are a legitimate representative of our own people or not. Uh, now, the interesting thing is this, that the France has been active not only in Mali and Chad, but it has had a very interesting presence in the whole of the Sahel region. This is a thin strip of land which basically has several countries with territories falling into the desert of Sahara and they divide Africa into two different zones altogether. There is Maghreb to the north and there is Central Africa to the south. But we must bear in mind that the Central Africa is not untouched by whatever is happening in this region. Uh, Central Africa again has many landlocked countries and the violence as it spills over, resistance to uh, Malian government at the present, the insurgents taking sanctuary and refuge in southern part of Libya, or violence spilling over to uh, Central African Republic, to Malawi, to Uganda, to South Sudan, we must bear in mind. So from the Atlantic coast, almost uh, to uh, skirting uh, the, uh, covering the girdling the whole of Africa, they end up uh, almost to the tip of Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. So this conflict has dimensions which are involving, impinging on interests of many countries in Africa and their patrons in Europe also. Why is Europe so interested in this region? Because some people could argue that this region is not particularly rich in natural resources, uh, although Niger and Nigeria flanking it are oil producing countries. There is some oil discovered in uh, in Mali also. Some uh, Chad is uh, the home country of the Lake Chad, the second largest lake in Africa on which the water, uh, drinking water supply, uh, survival, the water security depends of millions of Africans in this area, which is d prone to droughts, etc. So, and which unfortunately due to climate change, the lake has shrunk almost 90% in recent years. So, there is a climate crisis here, but more important than that, there is, this is a source where from the refugees have a unchecked influx to Europe and France's presence there is a little more reassuring for European countries by and large. But when Macron says we are going to withdraw, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You declare your intentions to withdraw, then you say you can't uh, accept any other military presence which these countries want to secure to fight their insurgents or their rebels or Islamic terror. The third thing which is very worrisome is that this is the hotbed or a nursery of the various splintered groups of Al-Qaeda. They use different names, uh, Arabic names, most of them. But then from Boko Haram to Niger in Nigeria to Al-Shabaab in uh, you know, Somalia, you have 
they keep changing their names and they regather, recapture, reorganize themselves. And this is this remote wilderness, desert wilderness of Africa provides them the opportunity to cross international borders unchecked. And because there is so much resentment against the legitimate governments, elected governments or dictatorial governments in this region, that people quickly switch sides. They are terrorized by both Islamic terrorists. They are terrorized by brigands, normal brigands. They are terrorized by ethnic uh, uh, strife. And unfortunately, these all these are legacies of colonialism. So the ill will or anger against an ex-colonial power is a natural phenomenon. And under these circumstances, when France indicates that it is getting tired, it is getting reluctant to spend money or lose lives of French soldiers in this area, they look at France with greater distrust. And when France uses, or the French president, tactlessly uses words which are provocative, it doesn't help matters at all. Now, this is not the first instance when a French convoy has been, a convoy has been ambushed and there have been casualties, um, in this case of civilian um, insurgents, but in some cases, French soldiers have been killed, uh, diplomats have been hijacked, UN personnel have been killed, ambushed, trapped. So this is a problem which is not going to disappear, it is being aggravated. And keep in mind the other civil war, which we shall talk about it a little later, in Ethiopia, between Ethiopia, Tigrayans, Eritrean involvement in that, spill over into Sudan, you have this whole Sahel belt as the next, not one Afghanistan, but many Afghanistans. And there could be a cascading effect. So this is what we shall discuss with you and try to untangle the web of uh, uh, other big powers external to the region having interest and skirmishing for advantage in this theater. It is not only the northwestern tip of Africa that is threatening to become erupt as another Afghanistan, a failed state, a region full of anarchy, violence, sanctuary for terrorism. When we turn our gaze elsewhere towards east, the northeastern tip of Africa is also plagued with the same kind of maladies. Uh, if you look at the Horn of Africa, there is Somalia, a land full of piracy, land full of lawlessness, a land where Chinese have established a naval base in Djibouti a place where there are repeated blasts uh, and there is a policy of the ruling government to live and let live with brigands, pirates and terrorists all in one go. But what we are more concerned is there are two countries, two major countries in this region which are having major trouble. Uh, let's begin with Sudan. And Sudan has had a long history of turbulence, uh, upheavals. Uh, there was a strong man called Bashir who had ruled with a strong arm his country for almost three full decades. There were, there were protests against him, there, were, there was corruption, there was ethnic strife, uh, there was violation of civil rights, but the state was somehow managing to survive. There was poverty, there was corruption, as we said. Uh, but people now, when they look back, they think that General Bashir's rule was a period of stability in their country. There was strife in southern Sudan, in Darfur region, there were droughts, there were humanitarian crises. But Somehow, Sudan seemed to be stumbling along, along, and it had established for itself some friends in the international arena. But what has been happening for the past two years is something far more serious. In 2019, Bashir, the long-serving tyrant, the autocrat, was overthrown, and he was replaced by another general, General Burhan. And General Burhan, uh, again, was not ruling as an autocrat. The problem was that there was a coalition kind of a thing. There was popular unrest, there were civilian uh, protest movements on the streets, and somehow there are 80 political parties, no less, in Sudan. They had forged some kind of a coalition among leading political parties that represent different regions, different ethnic groups, etc. They were all clamoring for a more democratic governance. So there was this compromise that arrived at between army and uh, the civil society members to have a coalition government which was aspiring as a transitional government. It claimed to be only a transitional arrangement towards democracy. But within two years, the failures of this arrangement have become quite clear. The Prime Minister Hamdok was uh, overthrown in a coup uh, by General Burhan. And what happened was he was put under house arrest. This led to 
great uh, international protests, anxiety. They thought that army had, was going to take over power and the experiment in democracy was being aborted. But interestingly in Sudan, what is noteworthy is that army may capture power through a coup, but army tries to retain some support because Khartoum is the biggest city, is the capital. And in Khartoum, you, the road leads to Port Sudan, which is the only access to the sea to various landlocked neighbors uh, of Sudan. So the, it, it is of great strategic significance. And Sudan is not without some resources of its own. Towards the north, it has gold, it has some oil, it has some other minerals. And of course, let's not forget that Sudan is a country which uh, through which the uh, life-giving stream of Nile flows through. So there are certain fertile fields also. But there is a great regional imbalance. So this has created historically problems. There also is a continuing state of, if not civil war, continuous warfare, low-key intensity, low-intensity violence between different tribes. And of course, the army enforces some kind of a discipline and law and order. But the army is very keen because the army cannot bank on uh, the support of all the ethnicities, all the tribes, all the rebellious groups. So it wants to have an imprint of support from the civil society. So when large-scale protest movements take place in uh, break out in Khartoum, the army tries to make a compromise, at least have a facade of having a, having a government which has approval of the large part of its population. But in 2019, unfortunately, when the army took over power, um, it had to shoot out at protesters who were turning violent and 87, 88 lives were lost then. And people were very, very unhappy and this made army very unpopular. Now, again, another fact, factor why, why the army in Sudan seeks some kind of a civilian support uh, all the time is because within the army, there are factions. So at the moment, there is an arrangement in the transitional government called something like a sovereign council, which exercises power. And the sovereign council is headed by a general, but there is an elected prime minister. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, the sovereign council, uh, which is almost like a cabinet in other situations, has a lot more army generals than there. But the army generals also represent different factions and different groups. And the, some people believe that the strong man, the real power behind the throne, is another general who is a commander of the rapid support force. Now, the rapid support force is an army within an army. And some people think that the, it is the private militia of the commander of this force. And he calls the shots. Now, he is supposed to be a man of humble beginnings, but then suddenly he has become very rich. And when he is confronted with these questions, he replies that I belong to a family of entrepreneurs. Our family had gold mine interests and we made our money earlier. So he is a wealthy man. He also commands the undivided loyalty of the rapid support force. And it was said that how do you maintain an army which is a different uniform? Where does the, the, where does the rapid support force get paid for? So his answers in a very candid interview to uh, Al Jazeera correspondent was uh, that all armies in the world have different uh, uniforms, the berries, the marines, uh, the seals, the army, navy, air force. So there is nothing strange about the force I command having a separate uniform. But he was very evasive about how they are paid for. They said they are paid for from the government's budget. If you want to know, ask the question to the finance ministry in my, in my government. This is a minor issue. But the major issue is that the army is itself divided among various factions, which have differing loyalties, different support from different ethnic groups, regional groups, etc. Sudan, after the civil war ended and the southern Sudan emerged as a new country, the youngest member of the African Union, that problem has subsided a little. But the Sudanese army has been active elsewhere. It has been active on the front where the, where the Ethiopian civil war is being fought. It has been active along the Sahel region. It has been active also helping out, claiming to help out brethren in southern Sudan also. Now, some people think that they are invaders, they are trying to recapture lost ground. Others do believe that they have not such all, all the time malicious intentions. But the problem is that the country of Sudan is plagued by economic problems. It has been struck by the COVID. It has charges of corruption against the army. And on top of that, when this coup took place, so this uneasy arrangement was again upset uh, this year in the last week of October, when another coup took place. And the Prime Minister, as we said earlier, was arrested and put under house arrest. Now, some people speculated that he was this was a slow coup. He was being eliminated totally. He would be taken to an unknown destination and we will not hear much about it. 
But so much was the pressure on Sudan. It has an economic crisis. It is coping with the pandemic. It cannot do without a, a international support. African Union suspended its membership. Uh, the Western countries stopped giving it economic aid. Uh, various ambassadors of the EU, EU countries met uh, the general in power and said that, look, this would not do. So they had to make a compromise. The prime minister, Hamdok, was released from house arrest and reappointed the prime minister. And he signed an agreement, a 14-page long agreement, which he says I dictate the terms of this peaceful transition to power. But people were not happy. People were not happy for two reasons. Those people who support General Burhan took to the streets and those people who criticized the army, who are opposed to army entering through back door, through coups, were on the street saying that the prime minister had betrayed them. They had Everybody talks of a revolution and everybody says that we are doing this for the revolution. But nobody defines what this Sudanese revolution was. We can't go back a decade and go back to the Arab Spring. It never had really taken roots in Sudan. So Sudan's problems date back to 30 years of unalloyed, brutal dictatorship. And then this revolution of an army general to perpetuate himself in power is not something which, the, which meets the aspirations of 60% of the youngsters who comprise the majority of the population of Sudan. So there is a very vague ambiguity about what democracy in Sudanese context is, what revolution in Sudanese context did. There is no agreement, but there is a great divide that the army wants to say that it is only a custodian of the people's interests, but the steps which it wants to take for reform, which are partly constitutional reform, partly reform of economy, uh, they would like to root it through an elected prime minister who could say that, look, this is what the people want. But the reforms are not all supported by the people because it is easy for a democrat or a a demagogic uh, autocrat to make uh, a populist uh, promises which he or she might not fulfill and the people can't do anything about it. But an elected prime minister has a problem of facing another, another election. The Sudanese, of course, would the generals would continue to insist that the elections there have been always free and fair and the people should trust their own prime minister. But the people think that the prime minister under duress, under pressure, has compromised his independence. He has betrayed the revolution. And except there is one clause in the agreement which says the government promises to hold free and fair elections by a certain date and have a civilian government form, but there is no guarantee that this would be done and the prime minister may lose support and credibility in coming days to come. No government in Sudan, democratic or autocratic, is in a position to bring out a miracle and restore the economy to good health, have effective vaccination and to end regional imbalances or to let the ethnic strife and also. So the problems remain. Temporarily, there is peace. The prime minister is back in his power, but lost his support base among the civilian, uh, those aspir aspiring for democracy. Army at the moment is effectively in control and has the prime minister on their side, has got some kind of an assurance from countries abroad to, to get back uh, aid and not it has not been restored to the full membership in African Union, but is no longer a paria, at least for the, for the time being. But any time, any moment, something might happen because the Sudanese armed forces are involved in Ethiopia. They are involved in southern Sudan. They are involved in elsewhere in the Sahel region. And one other thing remains to be understood. Just before this tumult started in Sudan and Ethiopia, or let's say the latest round of tumult started, there was this clash of interest between the Sudanese and the Ethiopians on, uh, and the Egyptians about the Grand Renaissance Dam. So this dispute remains. The reservoir of the Grand uh, Renaissance Dam had been uh, unilaterally filled up by the Ethiopians. But that crisis at the moment is on the back burner because the actual civil war-like situation or a coup or a revolt is on the in the headlines. Now, this is what we should remember about Sudan. Now, Sudan, on one hand, is linked to other Sahel countries, and on the other side, it is linked to Ethiopia. And Ethiopia it, itself is in deep trouble. So let's have a closer look at Ethiopia and then see how the two threaten the northwestern, northeastern tip of Africa as well, almost as badly as the northwestern tip is uh, concerned with Islamic terror, with the uh, Brigands with Mali, Chad, Malawi, Senegal, etc. This situation here is no better, unfortunately, at the moment.
when we come to ethiopia it seems to be a very tragic case of a hope belied a great disappointment for the international community when uh, the prime minister ebi had brought to end the civil war between ethiopia and eritrea he was awarded a nobel prize he was the darling of the western world he was supposed to be a man committed to democracy a man expert in international relations law and diplomacy who would modernize his country and modernize his country was not out of the reach for anybody's imagination because ethiopia is a country the second most populous country in africa a country with a rich tradition of living diverse faiths living in coexistence uh, large enough christian minority a longest lasting uh, imperial dynasty till hel selassie was ruling there so there was a revolt against him it was hoped that the era feudal era would end and it had imbibed a lot of uh, french and italian influence during the colonial period and also of course it had been enriched with the flow of the nile river so there was a, a long standing historical civilization where some people suggest humanity uh, was born the man uh, the first man homo sapiens made its appearance on this soil but interestingly very soon the hopes were belied because uh, uh, the tigrayans the tigrayans are a minority with that comprise about 6% of the ethiopian population had ruled as a majority party in ethiopia after uh, the tumult of uh, the revolt which ended the imperial dynasty had ended uh, for almost 25 Thirty years, when Abi came to power, their dominance in the government of Ethiopia ended, and they resented this. Although they were a microscopic, not microscopic, a small minority, but they dominated the army, they dominated the administration, they had controlled the politics. Now, this led to the friction between the provincial government uh, of Tigray and the Ethiopian central government. Now, the Ethiopian constitution is a complex one it has it is a federation and the fed, the federating states have a right to secede and to follow policies of their own within a certain limitation now the tigrayans did not say that they were seceding but the tigrayans objected to when ab announced uh, two years back uh, elections and these elections they he was postponing the elections uh, not announced the elections he actually announced the postponement of elections that should have taken place because he said the covid uh, pandemic was there but the tigrayans thought that this was an excuse to delay an election which might result in his loss of power in their region so they went ahead held their elections and effectively without declaring secession uh, decided that they would not follow the dictates of the federal central government it was too much for ab he decided to send army he first issued lots of ultimatums but then sent army and said uh, the people in tigray would be disciplined his armed forces were confronted by tigray people's liberation front a militia formed largely by people who were experienced battle hardened who had served in ethiopian army now not only had the tigrayan people been marginalized in politics electoral politics of, uh, from the parliament ab had also ensured that tigrayan soldiers and officers were disarmed and were uh, sent back uh, to their home now they were there trained angry frustrated and far more experienced than the central army in the beginning the ethiopian uh, armed forces made quick gains they they announced they had captured makale the provincial capital and they said in a few months the battle would be over the tigrayan people's liberation front people retreated regularly and took recourse into mountains and desert wilderness but kept mounting guerrilla attacks this continued for 5 to 6 months but then the tide of fortune turned suddenly the tigrayan forces started making defeating the central armed forces and kept coming towards the capital now the situation has become so acute that at one stage about a week back the tigrayan army claimed that they were about to capture the capital addis ababa although the distance was quite long they they still are about on a highway more than 100 kilometers away from uh, addis ababa but the position of the central government was very bleak uh, ab made repeatedly made provocative statements that i i invite all uh, uh, patriotic citizens of the country to join the fight and will fight the tigrayans till the last drop of our blood we will bury the enemy these were harsh words which did not uh, do anything towards reconciliation although it has been suggested that the tigrayan people were willing at one stage 
to have international mediation which will bring about a truce and buy some respite of time and then remedy the situation. Today the position is such that no side has uh, left any scope for retreat or peace or truce or because you know no side wants to surrender the advantage on the battlefield. Now uh, AB has been forced to say that he will lead his for, um, forces from the front. This is rather strange because he is not a military man. What would his personal presence on the battlefield would do is hard to understand besides building up the morale of his troops. So was the morale of the troops falling? Were they suffering reverses? Now, the claims made by the state media in Ethiopia are that they have recaptured some of the more strategically important towns and the fighting, bitter fighting is going on. And it says the army is fighting bravely on five fronts. But this is interesting because if you look objectively, what are these five fronts? They are fighting uh, with Tigrains towards the north. They are fighting uh, towards the east. They are fighting towards the west. They are fighting towards the south. And they have a problem with Sudanese. And if you look at it this way, you realize that if they are fighting on five fronts, maybe they are making some advances on one front. Maybe there is a stalemate. But no government can fight on five fronts simultaneously and claim that this is suppressed is going to leave a very bitter legacy of people dead on the battle, people wounded on the battlefield, civilians who have been killed, who have been caught in the crossfire. And unfortunately, there have been very grave charges, many of them verified by international observers who have no partisan interest that both Tigrayans and Ethiopian army are guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, acts of genocide, uh, burning villages, burning crops, killing livestock. So all this is leaving Ethiopia in a state of turmoil where uh, reconciliation is going to be extremely difficult even if through some miracle truce is put into force or a ceasefire is worked out. And this will render uh, the Ethiopian Prime Minister's credibility and his uh, hold on power very gravely in stake. For him, it is a do or die battle. For Tigrayans, the problem is that the Eritreans, encouraged by AB, have also tried uh, salami slicing. Uh, they, they had eyed the Tigrayan land for a long time there. So this is the situation in Ethiopia. Now the Ethiopian problem also merges into towards the Horn of Africa, towards Somalia, where, as we have mentioned before, international uh, terrorists are on rampage, where the government has followed a policy very suicidally of live and let live. Corruption is rampant. Pirates uh, continue to operate with impunity. Now all this is a situation which doesn't augur well for anybody. You wish luck to Ethiopians. You wish the best to the Sudanese. But there is no sign that they are going to overcome their regional, tribal, ethnic, linguistic, religious differences. There is no hope of uh, corruption ending overnight. And the economic plight is getting, going to be from bad to worse as long as peace returns. So E.B. in his fit of rage, fit of peak, asked the UN observers to get out of the um, country, uh, get the humanitarian reliefs. Uh, workers to get out of the country, ask the ambassadors of major countries to be persona non gratas and expels them. This is not the responsible way of managing a crisis. But we can't blame an individual. The roots of the crisis in Ethiopia, like the roots of the crisis in Sudan, date back decades. And the rest of the world is now waking up to a situation because they have neglected these countries, they have overlooked these countries. And as far as the United States of America is concerned, uh, the Secretary of State toured Africa recently and talked that how America would always support democracy. But there was one African leader who had the bluntness to tell that the American model of democracy is not what the Africans were looking for. They were looking for a regime which was free from corruption, free from partisanship in terms of ethnicities, and a, and a government which was responsive to human rights. That's all. That was their understanding of African democracy. Uh, not the Western imposition of democracy or institutions, which have never taken root on the African, in the African soil. So this is what the problem remains of new Afghanistan. Where would be the new Afghanistan? It would be anywhere in uh, northeastern Africa or northwestern Africa. It could even be South Africa, where the latest uh, coronavirus uh, variant has 
led to a knee-jerk reaction kind of imposition of stopping flights to southern Africa. And the southern African president Cyril Ramaphosa has had to say, make a statement, that why are we ostracizing it? You are leaving us at the moment of our greatest need. And this is the surefire prescription for preparing the grounds for a situation which might be replicating something like Sudan, Ethiopia, Chad, Mali, elsewhere, uh, Niger, Nigeria, in Southern Africa also. This is all we have for you this week and we look forward to meeting you next week. But till that time, please try to have a revision of what we have discussed and try to think what role can India play in this moment of need of countries in Africa, whether it is Northwest tip, whether it is the Northeastern tip, whether we, we are talking in the context of East Coast of Africa or Southern Africa, where people of Indian origin comprise a large chunk of the population, or are we, like other countries, interested in Africa only when we are looking for a market, raw material, resources, energy, oil, and then forget about it, what is happening the rest of the time. So in terms of energy security, we look towards Nigeria. In terms of food security, we are looking at Ethiopia at one time. At humanitarian interventions of India via United Nations, we did play a great role in 1960s in, in Congo. But since then, our record is rather odd. And in South Africa, we seem to have been a party to a corrupt regime and people of Indian origin, which has made us lose a lot of goodwill for India in this region. And when we talk of Southern Africa, we don't only talk of South Africa, we talk in terms of uh, Angola and Mozambique, we talk in terms of Botswana, Namibia, uh, Swaziland, Lesotho, we talk in terms of Zimbabwe, and all these are countries which are so closely intertwined with each other that uh, you cannot say that violence at one place will not move over to another place. So India should carefully watch its step in Africa. We can't abandon Africa. We have relationships like BRICS. We have uh, other G20 mayor relationships. But little again what we can do immediately. So goodbye and thank you.